Carl, today we're going to talk about normative ethics. And one of the big things we're going to talk about is consequentialist versus non-consequentialist ethics. So let me ask you a question. If you had to kill me in order to... Wait, Carl, I haven't even finished yet. What do you mean, of course you would? I haven't even told you what you would get out of it. Don't you want to at least know what good would come out of killing me? Some things are their own reward. Carl, that is dark. I'm going to make you watch this whole series when we're done. Like, seriously, a couple of times. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to this video lecture for Catholic Social Learning. Today, we're going to dip our toes into the waters of normative or prescriptive ethics. We call this type of ethics normative or prescriptive because it tells people how they ought to behave or what kind of people they ought to be. There are many different theories of normative ethics, but we often focus on three main umbrella theories, consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics. I'm going to focus on those three theories in this video, but it's important to note that there are other normative theories worth exploring. Feminist ethics of care, situational ethics, and so on. Before diving into the three umbrella theories, let me explain why I think it makes sense to begin by exploring these particular theories. Think about a human action, any human action. It involves at least three essential components. An agent, the person who acts, the act the agent commits, and the outcome of the act. Now, some human actions, like blinking or breathing, are governed by our subconscious brain. We don't consider these moral acts because they don't involve any consciousness or choice. But when the acts of an agent are freely and consciously chosen, they qualify as moral acts. Each of the three umbrella theories roughly corresponds to one of these essential components of human action. Virtue ethics focuses on the agent, asking questions about what type of person we should strive to be what type of character we should seek to develop. In other words, virtue ethics tells us what it means to be a good person. Deontology focuses on the act itself. According to this theory, we have a duty or obligation to do certain acts because the acts are right in and of themselves. Likewise, we have a duty or obligation to avoid certain actions because those actions are wrong in and of themselves. Consequentialism focuses on the outcomes of acts. Like deontology, consequentialism tells us which acts we should do and which acts we should avoid. However, unlike deontology, consequentialism doesn't view acts as intrinsic right or wrong. Instead, acts are right or wrong based on the outcome that they produce. We can generalize these theories a bit more. Two of the theories, deontology and consequentialism, focus on which acts are right and which acts are wrong. One of the theories, virtue ethics, focuses on what it means to be a good person, to have a good character, and to live a good life. So, we can divide these three umbrella theories into two categories. Ethics of doing, which includes the act-focused theories of deontology and consequentialism, and ethics of being, which includes the character-focused theory of virtue ethics. Okay, now that we've provided some basic groundwork, let's take a look at each category more closely. First, Consequentialism. As already noted, consequentialism focuses on the rightness or wrongness of actions, and it judges the rightness or wrongness of actions based on the outcomes those actions produce. This means that, strictly speaking, actions can't be intrinsically right or wrong. An action like murder, for instance, isn't wrong in and of itself. It's only wrong if it produces bad enough consequences. Of course, if you're not evil like Carl, you might say, well, of course murder produces bad consequences. Hello? It's murder. Sorry, Carl, you reap what you sow. But this point actually raises an important question for consequentialism. How do we decide what counts as a good and bad consequence? Is it what makes someone happy? Is it what gives someone pleasure? Is it what reduces pain? Is it what produces flourishing? Is it just a matter of preference? And this raises another question. Who matters when we're calculating consequences? Whose happiness? Whose pleasure? Who's pain? Who's flourishing? Consider the normative theory of ethical egoism, which is often associated with the American philosopher Ayn Rand. Hey Carl, what do the ethical egoists say they did when they saw a giant crocodile? Ayn Rand. I just made that up. Seriously, just now I just made that up. What do you mean it's obvious? This theory is arguably a form of consequentialism. It's consequentialist because it maintains that the right action for any individual to perform is the one that either maximizes or at least strongly promotes the well-being of that individual. So the rightness or wrongness of an action depends on whether or not the outcome of that action is conducive to the well-being 
of the person performing the act. It's possible, given this ethical outlook, to imagine a scenario in which murder would be the right thing to do, in the sense that committing murder would provide the greatest benefit to the one doing the murder. Of course, most people who advocate ethical egoism would argue that living in a society that outlaws murder is ultimately what's best for each individual. Otherwise, you might be murdered. Especially if you live in a society with Carl. So there is that. On the completely opposite end of the consequentialist spectrum is ethical altruism. This theory measures the rightness or wrongness of an action based on how it benefits other people, not yourself. Again, depending on our definition of murder, it's possible to imagine murder being acceptable here. For example, imagine a case of vigilanteism, in which case you murder someone to protect others, even at great risk to yourself. Two things should be clear at this point. First, any theory that measures rightness or wrongness based on outcomes, whether for individuals, for others, or for any set group, is by definition consequentialist. Second, consequentialism doesn't play well with the idea of natural rights, which is the idea that certain creatures, typically humans, have innate rights, such as the right to life and freedom, that cannot be violated by others. This second point is pretty clear when we look at the most famous form of consequentialism, utilitarianism. As a modern theory of ethics, utilitarianism is rooted in the work of the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Bentham argues that the idea of natural rights are silly, nonsense upon stilts, and that the only reasonable way to decide how to act is to ask a fundamental question. What maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain for the most amount of creatures who can experience pleasure and pain? Note here that Bentham is concerned for all people, and actually all animals that can experience pleasure and pain, not just himself, as was the case with ethical egoism, and not just others, as was the case with ethical altruism. Bentham argued that if an action maximized pleasure and minimized pain for the most amount of people, then it was the right thing to do, even if it violated the freedom of certain individuals. Second, deontology. Deontology comes from the Greek word deon, which translates as duty. This theory of ethics maintains that we have a duty or obligation to perform or avoid performing certain actions. Now, in one sense, we can argue that consequentialists believe the same thing. After all, consequentialists believe that we have a duty or obligation to perform actions that produce the best consequences, and avoid performing actions that produce suboptimal consequences. But what makes deontology unique is that we are supposed to do certain acts, or avoid doing certain acts, for the sole reason that it's our duty to do them, regardless of the consequences those acts produce. Probably the most famous form of deontology was put forward by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant actually developed his theory in response to the utilitarianism of Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Kant argued that human beings, as rational agents, could use reason to discover the foundations of moral truth and know how to live rightly. Here's how Kant worked it out. Because human beings have reason, we have the ability to make decisions based on more than mere instinct. Humans can act on things other than our preferences or innate desires. Kant called our ability to do this autonomy. Because humans can act autonomously, rather than merely out of preference or instinct, Kant argued that we can choose to act for the sake of duty. And for Kant, this is the only moral reason to act. For Kant, you're not morally praiseworthy if you do the right thing because it feels good, because that's just acting in line with your preferences or your desires. We're only praiseworthy if we do the right thing for the primary reason that it's the right thing to do. It's our duty. This raises an interesting question. What is the right thing to do? Kant argues that we can reason out what the right thing to do is by discovering what he calls the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is basically a master universal rule. It applies to all people at all times. Kant developed at least two versions of the categorical imperative. The first is, you should only act according to principles that you would accept everyone else acting according to. So, imagine a scenario in which you steal something, and you tell yourself it's okay that you stole it because you really, really want it. Now ask yourself, would you be okay if someone stole something of yours because they really wanted it? If the answer is no, it's not a categorical imperative, because you don't want everyone to live by that principle. In essence, Kant is saying we should act in ways that don't make an exception of ourselves. We should live by rules that we would be willing to apply to everybody else. Kant's second version of the categorical imperative is, always treat persons, by which he means rational agents, as ends in themselves.
themselves, and never merely as means. In other words, don't use people as if they were disposable tools. Treat them with the respect that persons deserve. Other deontological approaches include theories that emphasize the importance of rights and divine command ethics, which argue that human duties are based on commands given by God. Deontological theories, like that of Immanuel Kant, have helped pave the way for the idea of human rights, which most people think is a good thing, but sometimes deontological ethics can seem a little too unbending. For example, Kant argued that we have an absolute duty to tell the truth, or at least to avoid lying, even going so far as to say that it would be immoral to lie to a murderer about where their victim is hiding. Some modern versions of deontology offer a softer approach. The Scottish philosopher W. D. Ross argues that we can have conflicting duties. For instance, the duty to tell the truth and the duty to protect the innocent from murderers, and that we have to consider which duty carries the most weight in each particular circumstance. For example, sometimes telling the truth might be more important than protecting someone's feelings. But in other cases, the opposite might be true. We have to take these things on a case-by-case -case basis. Third, Virtue ethics. While virtue ethics has seen a resurgence in modern ethics, in a sense it's the oldest of the three theories, tracing its roots back to Greek philosophy, especially the work of Aristotle. Virtue ethics begins with a broader question than, what is the right action? It asks, what is good? Or, what does it mean to live a good life? To answer this question, we have to begin with some conception of what it means to be a good person. In a way, we might argue that both Bentham and Kant do this. For Bentham, you're a good person if you consistently act in a way that maximizes benefit for the most amount of people. For Kant, you're a good person if you consistently act in accordance with your duty. And it would be wrong to draw a sharp line between the theories and argue that virtue ethics has no place in utilitarianism or deontology. But for virtue ethics, the story is a bit more complicated. Think of it this way. For utilitarianism, the moral person does the right thing, which is whatever maximizes benefit and minimizes harm. For a Kantian, the moral person does the right thing for the right reason, which is to say they do their duty because it's their duty. But for a virtue ethicist, a moral person builds up the various character traits of a good person, which might include courageousness, kindness, compassion, love, loyalty, honesty, temperance, reciprocity, and so on, such that the right kinds of actions naturally flow from that person's character. Furthermore, virtue ethicists tend to emphasize the importance of wisdom, which helps them to know what a virtue is and how to exercise it. For example, Aristotle taught that a virtue was a golden mean between two extremes. Courage, for instance, was the mean between the extreme of cowardliness and the opposite extreme of foolhardiness. Someone with the virtue of wisdom would know that it's cowardly not to help a child who's being attacked by a small puppy. They would also know that it's foolhardy to try to stop a missile with your bare hands. And wisdom really changes and complicates the picture. For the virtue ethicist, the moral person does the right thing for the right reason at the right time, in the right way, because that is who they are. That's their character. Aristotle's virtue ethics are referred to as teleological because for Aristotle, in order to know what a thing's virtues are, you have to know what its telos is. Telos is a Greek word that translates as purpose or end. By way of analogy, sharpness is a virtue of a steak knife because the telos of a steak knife is to cut things that are tough. For a teleological virtue ethicist then, one central question is, what is the telos or purpose of a human being? For Aristotle, to know what a thing's telos is, you have to know what its nature is. And for Aristotle, human beings were rational and social animals. Because human beings are both rational and social, characteristics like honesty, justice, friendliness, and generosity were important for Aristotle. People who view human beings differently, of course, will come up with different virtues. As one example, some feminist virtue ethicists have argued that Aristotle's vision is based on a masculine view of the world to the exclusion of the experience of women. In other words, Aristotle takes the experience of men and just applies it to all people. But the experience of men, and a particular group of men, doesn't account for the experience of all people. So, for a fuller-bodied virtue ethics, we have to have a fuller-bodied view of the human experience. This basic introduction to normative ethics is just that, a basic introduction. If you're interested in more details about the three views I've discussed, or other views, check out some of my other videos. I'll put links in the description. Or check out some of the articles or books that I've listed there. In the next video in this series, we're going to discuss applied and professional ethics. Until then, farewell. Thank you.